You've seen how the name mappings in the web.xml file specify the URL that is to be used to run the servlet. You have some options here. You can actually have more than one mapping for a servlet. The basic form of the web.xml file is the same as in the previous examples, but this one contains a couple of new servlet mapping tags. This first one assigns the URL name three name, the second one assigns show slash three name, and the third one assigns just the simple name three. It's the web.xml file that assigns the names, so the servlet really has no control over what it's called in the URL. This servlet displays two lines of text. The first one, this line displayed at the top, identifies this as the servlet with three names. This method call to get request URL returns a string object that contains the URL that came in causing the servlet to be displayed. Notice that this is a method of the request object passed in as an argument. In future lessons I'll be showing you how various methods of this request object can be called to return just about anything you'd like to know. Anyway, this servlet displays the URL as it came in from the web browser. This script compiles the servlet, packages it, and deploys it to the server. So, now we can look at it. There's the servlet page as it's generated by the first of the three names. And there it is with its second name. And the third name. Notice that the application name has to be present in the URL, but after that you can use any name you like inside the web.xml file to locate the specific servlet. Oh, here's another one you can do. This version of web.xml has only one name for the servlet, but the name ends with .html. This will cause your servlet to masquerade itself as a static web page. It looks like a static page from the outside here, but it's actually a page generated by a servlet. Okay, there's one more note about the name mapping. You'll notice that the map names in these examples all started with a slash character. On the container that I've been using, this is actually optional. I've read about some containers that require the slash, and some that require that you don't include the leading slash. I guess you'll just have to try yours and see what happens. I suggest you start off with the slash included, because that seems to be the way Sun Documentation likes it.